Hey, what's going on, everybody? You're tuning into another episode of 20 Tim Minutes. I am your host, Tim McCarthy, and today I'm joined by Nate Carroll of the great state of Wisconsin. He broke the world record for push-ups in a year as part of an effort to raise money for the Tunnel of Towers Foundation. And his push-up count was more than 1.5 million and did it on the 50-yard line at MetLife Stadium in New Jersey. All right, let's start off with why was it done at MetLife Station, MetLife Stadium in New Jersey as a Wisconsin man? Well, so I the whole year this this challenge was to raise money for the Tunnel to Towers Foundation. So as I approached the uh, record, they wanted me to come out to New York and pass it out there. And then they stuck me in Jersey. So I, I went out to Jersey to pass it, but it was close enough to New York. But it was to kind of honor what uh, we had worked towards the entire year. Perfect. Perfect. Sorry for jumping the gun. I just see that Wisconsin to New Jersey. And I feel like I say Wisconsin the, the right way like you do. And I don't know why it is. Um, <laughs> it's one of my favorite accents going. But sorry, Nate, how are you today? I'm doing really good, Tim. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for thanks for uh, talking with me today. I love your story. We talked before uh, real briefly, and I think we talked probably the longest I've talked with anybody before a show. So that was awesome. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. 1.5 million plus push-ups uh, over the course of a year. When did that start? What date did it start and what date did it end? So it started June 14th of 2020. And the final day was June 13th of this year. So it's about two months ago was the uh, the final day. So and I passed the record on June 6th. So I had a, about seven, eight days left to do push ups after I passed that record. Fantastic. What's the exact number? Do you know off the top of your head? Well, sure. It's uh, one million five hundred and six thousand nine hundred eleven push ups. Wow. That is such a distinct number. <laughs> <laughs> now, who was the person that had it before you? So his name's Patty Doyle. He's from England, and that record was set back in 1988 and into 1989. So it stood for probably 32 years. Has he contacted you at all? I contacted him probably a year and a half, maybe two years ago, just to kind of try to pick his brain a little bit and to see kind of how he approached it and what he did. And uh, I haven't, I haven't reached out to him since I passed it, and he hasn't yelled at me, so he hasn't reached out to me either. So uh, another American victory over England. I just love to see it. So that guy that probably, nice? he probably absolutely hates you. Um, well, yeah, this guy's got a ton of records, so he probably doesn't even care. But really. He's a badass. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, I think he's like a, like a paratrooper, one of the special forces. So the guy's nuts. I mean, so he, you know, this is probably just a walk in the park for him. So we might have to get you both on and do a 20 minute push up contest. See who can be the 20, <laughs> yeah. 10 minute push up contest. Um, that's awesome. I, I absolutely love that. I actually, push ups are like one of the best forms of exercise. And it, mm -hmm. I think the hardest part is getting your form ready. A lot of people have like their, not so good form like their back or t back is too arch or it's too tucked in like what is like the best type of form if you can explain it like how like it should your arms be shoulder length apart like how so what is for me i think i mean a lot of people do their elbows out i've always i've tucked my elbows for whatever reason i think for the amount of push-ups it seemed to give me a little bit more support so they weren't so exposed um so i i just tuck them in and go down i mean that's kind of how that was my my motion the entire time. I never, you know, a lot of people do diamond push-ups yeah. and all sorts of crazy stuff. So I did that in anticipation of this record kind of training, preparing, but primarily it was about, you know, a little past shoulder and elbows tucked in. So that's now, how you, I did them. You just do it yourself, like figure it out. Or did you have somebody make sure you had the right form? Like, um, so I've been doing push-ups for 20 years. I mean, so it's something that it's an exercise, like you said, that it's a great exercise. It's one that for me, I'm, I'm not a gym rat. It's not something that has ever been terribly appealing to me. It's kind of stripped down bare bones. And so it's an exercise that it's just me against gravity and my will to do it. So it's something that I, I like to do and, um, and did a lot of them actually. I don't think there's anything more American than just a push up, especially with everyone that served. It's just like drop down and give me 20 is pretty yeah. much the standard. That's how you, you hear it all the time. And it is. I mean, it's one of those exercises that, you know, people, anytime I would say like, yeah, I'm doing this. I mean, the th first thing they'd say is like, well, I haven't done that many push-ups in my lifetime. So it, it, it's always a good conversation. I mean, you don't have that same kind of conversation with sit-ups or jumping jacks or any of that crap. It's the push-up for whatever reason is a, an attractive exercise for many people to comment on. Yeah, it's the perfect one to just get you warmed up to just yeah. crank out 20 push-ups and just you're ready to go. 
It really um, works your body good. Now, the first one that you did, did you? You must have kept track of these from one to one point five. Uh, I did to eleven. Now, did you contact the um, Guinness Book of World Records, and what did they yep. say? So I the the records pending, so they have to certify it. So I've I've sent it to the American. Uh, or not, I'm sorry, the, the International Record Holders Association. So they're verifying it and that is pending as well. So it's a it's a process and they say usually it takes about three to six months to uh, to verify it. So my hope is that they will, so obviously doing 4,000 pushups a day, you can't record every one of them. So what I did is I recorded as much as I could. I would log each set and then I'd have people that would, you know, just by default of me being around them, I, they were invited to verify my push-up. So then they would write, they wrote letters at the end saying, mm -hmm. yeah, this is what I saw this knucklehead doing mm -hmm. for the past, you know, 365 days. So, so yeah, so all that's been compiled and then that's part of the package that uh, will be used to hopefully certify the record. I, I want to talk to the poor bastard that has to watch all those push-ups uh, and make sure they're all verified. So my office mate, so I work at a prison and I share an office with the, my office mate, Ashley. And uh, yeah, she got so sick and tired of seeing me on the ground in her office doing push-ups. She'd walk over me, step over me. Sometimes she'd kick me in the head, but you know, she's a good sport. But yeah, she was always like, man, it's gonna be weird not seeing you on the ground all the time. Right, take a year off. Um, yeah, I mean, it's crazy, but she I, was a good sport and I appreciated it. Are you worried that like maybe like one of the push-ups wasn't official and now your number might go down one or two? or what's how does that work well see the funny thing is so like i, I kept track of all these push-ups in the in this log book and you know i don't know about you but sometimes you know i'm not the brightest guy in the world so you know oh, i'd go yeah. through and i'd add them all up and then i'd be like oh fuck i got a different number now so i counted all these push-ups on four different occasions to ensure that that number is what it was so I, I hope I didn't screw it up four times in a row, but I, I did. I, I was meticulous with it because I, I wanted it. I wanted it to end on 9/11, obviously, for yeah. uh, the reason being that the 20th anniversary of 9/11 is coming up, and uh, that foundation, the Tunnel to Towers Foundation, started as a result of what happened in New York on 9/11. Great segue. Now, how does the push-ups correlate with the Tunnel of Towers Foundation? I know we talked about it briefly, but do you mind going into a uh, greater detail about that, like raising awareness money? What, what is that yeah. all about? Well, I mean, so so in 2019, I did a million push-ups, and so it was kind of preparing me for this challenge. And so I want I was going to initially start it on January 1st of 2020, but I, uh, I I injured my shoulder, so or injured my elbow. I'm sorry. So I kind of pushed it back, and it got me thinking. And I, I was aware of the foundation, and I really started thinking like, well, why don't I couple this with you know something that's far greater than a push-up world record? So I reached out to that foundation kind of pitch my idea. I initially said 1.5 million push-ups for $1.5 million. That was the goal that I, that, that's what I wanted. Yeah. And uh, they liked the idea. They thought it kind of was in line with what they, what they value and just my support of first responders and uh, being in the military myself. And so they said, yeah, let's do it. So they supported me kind of throughout the whole year in kind of promoting it and, you know, kind of, you know, getting me connected with, you know, people to do interviews or whatever. So right. uh, it worked out real well. So it was, uh, it was just a very humbling experience. And that foundation for people that aren't aware of it, I mean, they have a couple different programs, but the one I primarily worked for was their fallen first responder home program, which pays off the mortgages of fallen first responders who leave behind a family with young children. So they step in, pay off that mortgage. So that family isn't burdened with that financial um, weight over their head and those young kids can stay in the house where they made their memories with mom and dad so it's it's kind of, I mean it gives me always chills just even saying that to think that I that I helped you know people that you know lost a mom or dad in service to our nation or our country I legit got goose pimples just hearing that I like that a lot that's a great foundation how much money did you end up raising I think it was it was about it was over forty thousand dollars. So it, Holy shit. one of the things they always ask for is to have you know to donate eleven dollars a month, and so I was able to attract apparently a lot of monthly donors. So the the, the base number is over forty thousand, but I'm I'm hopeful that it's closer to about fifty thousand with with after all the monthly donors when you know they maybe fall off at some point. So so between forty and fifty thousand dollars I raised. I always love hearing about new foundations that uh, I don't know about, and that one's a great one. So the Tunnel of Towers Foundation. If anyone's uh, wondering how to wondering how to donate, they can definitely Google them and probably find them pretty easily, right? 
Yep. T2T.org. I mean, as simple as that. And you can learn about their fall. They take care of, they do the same thing for Gold Star families and catastrophically injured veterans. They'll build smart homes or they'll pay off their home and refurbish their home to make it so they can live a more independent life. So, I mean, really, if you think about anybody who serves this nation, they have something they do to, to contribute to help that that service member or woman and or that family if they uh, if they pay that ultimate sacrifice. So just a great organization. Perfect. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see the link below. If you're listening to this, you can see it in the show notes. They click it pretty easily. I make it easy for people out there, you know? Um, people so, like me. Yeah, people like me. <laughs> so you said you were a former Marine, correct? I was in the Marine Reserve, yeah, for about seven years. Fantastic. Um, so I know you picked like first responders in anything. Was there like a like a thing, in, thing like a defining moment? You're like, you know what? I'm going to help first responders. Well, maybe not a defining moment, but just kind of a general kind of like awareness of what they do. So like I, I was just explaining to somebody this morning, it's like what, why I think it's so important, like for as a parent, like I'm willing to, you know, give my life for my kids, right? I'm willing to put myself in between them and danger. And really, when you think about it, that's what these first responders do every day for perfect strangers. So like for me, being a father of young children, I was thinking, I think maybe one of the catalysts was, you know, there might've been a school shooting or something. And I see, you know, these first, these police officers running into the school, you know, ending the danger, saving these children. And I just thought to myself, like, man, like, these people provide a blanket of security to all of us and they're there in a moment's notice if we're ever in a situation like that or something similar where we're in need of something and they're willing to kind of put their life on the line. So I just, the older I get, the more kind of aware I am and just appreciative I, if I am of them for what they do and the impact that they have on me or the potential impact that they, they could have on my children, you know, maybe when I'm not there to protect them, so to speak. Right. Did you, uh, so it seems like you, you, the kids were a big motivation even behind the pushups. Absolutely. So, I mean, for my kids, I mean, they're 14, 12 and 10 and, you know, they, they're not as impressed with it because they saw it every day. Like, oh, dad doing more pushups, big deal. But right. what I, what I really wanted them to, to take away from this experience is, is to take a goal that looks so difficult, that looks so impossible and yet see how, what it looks like to work towards that. Then ultimately, thankfully, I was able to, to pass that record, achieve that goal so that, you know, 10, 15 years from now, when they're, you know, in their early twenties, pursuing their passion, pursuing their dreams, they can look back at this moment and say, you know, if my old man can do 4,000 pushups, you know, I can study for this test or I can chase whatever it is that I want to accomplish. Because the whole course of this thing, it created a lot of teachable moments, a lot of scenarios where we got to have discussions about life and, you know, kind of what it takes, what it looks like. And then I thought the beautiful thing was it wasn't about me. It was about servicing, you know, other people. And so hopefully that they take away that and that they contribute to society in whatever way they do. So that's kind of why I thought it was um, a special thing for our family. That's just being a good dad. Yeah. <laughs> how was it for you in the Marines? How was that mentally? It was good. I mean, so when I was younger, I was, I wasn't always, uh, I, I didn't have the perspective necessary. So I was kind of, you know, angry as a kid and whatever. So I didn't really, um, I don't think take the, take away from that when I was in that, that I do now, like the perspective I have now is much more, um, appreciative and understanding the importance of it. I mean, I was a angry kid and didn't really, you know, think much of, um, things outside of myself. So as I've aged, it's been a, a definitely something that I have much more appreciation for, but it really kind of set the, I think the, you know, the foundation, the groundwork for endurance sports and probably where push-ups obviously came from they say in boot camp you're either smart or strong and i was certainly strong mm -hmm. and uh so it, it's uh, but it's something like that takeaway that i had in boot camp and in my time in the service has really you know kind of paved the way for me all throughout my life and just kind of things the mindset necessary and the the dedication that's required to to accomplish big goals well i appreciate your service sir Thank you. Now you said you were an angry kid. Where does that stem from? How was, uh, how was it growing up? Well, so my mom was not in my life. She, you know, my parents divorced when I was uh, like seven or whatever it was. And she kind of disappeared. Wasn't really in my life much with any consistency. And my dad was around, but he was, you know, I don't know how to describe him. He was just kind of like emotionally invalidating. Wasn't really, um, you know, he never let you know that you're doing good or that you're, you know, that everything's all right. He was there and that was about it. So I grew up with this kind of like sense of like, 
you know, I was angry about things or I was a burden or I wasn't good enough. And, you know, so that manifests itself in your, you know, young adulthood towards, you know, being an asshole to people and being uh, mean and being angry. And so I kind of carried all that with me. And, uh, you know, it, it took a, it took a lot of work to kind of channel that in a positive direction. So that's kind of where that came from. I feel like that's a whole generation thing back in the day. I don't know how old you are, but I feel like your parents grew up in that day and age where like you had to toughen up your son and be like, you know what, put some dirt on it. Don't cry. Don't show emotions. And that's what led to probably just being angry, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that you're right with that. And, uh, and I mean, obviously, you know, like parenting today is much different. Than, I mean, like I, I remember when my kids were a little younger you know i couldn't imagine them going biking across the street you know i would gone all day and nobody gave a shit what i was doing yeah, yeah. And so just kind of like the perspective of parenting and has changed and and so yeah it was a lot i, I don't know if it was hands off when i was a kid but it was certainly like just go and just get out of here ride your bike do whatever you got to do and uh we'll see you when we see you I was in that kind of transition because I'm 35 now. So I grew up like in the 90s and early 2000s. So like once the streetlights came on, I went home. I had like a beeper for no reason and shit. So now like seeing it now, it is like totally different, especially with like social media and everything. Now it's like you can track your kids and they're like, no, nah, I'll cut home. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's very different today. Um, what's next for you? Well, I'm just going to I'm going to continue to look for opportunities to you know, be a good member of my community. Um, always looking for opportunities to say thank you to people who serve. So, um, and I'm hopeful to do a marathon forward and backwards with uh, a big pack on my back. So that's, that's kind of the next thing I want to do a marathon backwards and forwards, not backwards, like walking backwards, but do it in reverse and then forward. So 52.4 miles. How did you not get bored doing all those pushups? Did you listen to music or anything? I watch the, yeah, I listen to music. I watch TV and I really, I mean, it's for, for me, I, I always kept it in perspective that it's, it, it wasn't about me. It was about helping families. And, and I, I was just telling somebody this story the other day, like, you know, cause they're like, well, didn't it suck doing it? And it, yeah, it sucked all the time. I mean, it's in mentally and physically, I mean, it hurts to do that many push ups Sometimes you're sore, you're tired. And then the mental fatigue. I mean, I know there were times where, you know, I'd get home at night or whatever. And, you know, it's like nine 30 and I still got a thousand freaking pushups I got to do. And I'm tired and I want to lay on the couch and eat ice cream and watch TV, but I had to do that. So, but I always kept in mind, I always kept in perspective that, you know, I could quit anytime and then nobody would care. Like, you know, my pain would go away, so to speak. But these families that I was helping, like they can't just turn it off. I mean, the burden that they carry, the loss of their mom or their dad is something that they can't just, you know, check out and tap out and say, well, I'm done with this. So that really kind of kept me in perspective to continue to endure some of the, you know, the mental side of it and the physical side of it. Because, I mean, it does suck doing that many push-ups. Yeah. I mean, there's no way around it. There's no way I'm even close to like 500 last year. I think I'm in like the 200s ballpark. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot. And like I say, but for me, the other thing I, I, I try to really kind of ingrain in me, it's, it's, it's who I am. It's not what I do. And what I mean by that is like, if it's something I do, I can quit doing it at any time. And cause it's something else is more attractive or, you know, easier, but if it's who you are, it really gives you the traction to grit through some of that, that those tough times. So that's really what I try to incorporate is like, this is just who I am and this is what I got to do. And it's for, it's not about me at all. It's about, you know, my kids and my community and, and the people that serve our communities. That's what I was going to say. Who was your biggest supporter going, going with this? Is it your kids? I think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, like it's funny because like, you know, they saw me doing it every day and it's like, you know, whatever, dad, you know, you do more pushups, but I mean, they, you know, they, they saw it up close. And I, I think for me, this was a, a pocket of time that I'm hopeful will, you know, impact them maybe for the rest of their lives. And, you know, if I drop dead tomorrow or, you know, the flags start waving because of the tornado, that's yeah, buzzing yeah, yeah. Overhead, you know, that, that this pocket of time will, will live in them and provide for them the opportunity to endure, you know, whatever it is that that self doubt that, that, you know, the, the negativity that, you know, that they, they face that they will encounter chasing their dreams. I think you're going to say no to this question. Uh, what was the toughest thing in your life? Was it doing these pushups? Toughest thing in my life was probably, I mean, two things. I mean, growing up with a broken home and being involved in a relationship that was uh, pretty toxic, pretty emotionally uh, abusive. 
that really grinded me down to a nub in my adulthood. And it was like, it coupled, you know, the shit that I thought growing up, you know, about myself that I was no good or that I was a piece of shit or whatever it was. And then I, I, I got married to this lady who, you know, everything was great in the beginning, the relationship settles and then it's all haywire. And so like the things she was saying to me were the things that I was thinking about mm. myself as a kid. And it really kind of locked into this, this tough time. And so that's probably been the, the two toughest moments of my life. Did she use that against you knowingly that you said those things before, or was it kind of just a coincidence? No, I, I mean, I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm sure it was intentional. I don't know if it was deliberate, you know, I mean, it's certainly, I mean, she had a lot of issues, I think herself and, and, you know, when people are, you know, when hurt people, hurt people. I always say that. And then she yeah. was a hurt person as well. And uh, yeah, it was just a, it was a fucking nightmare. And, uh, but I, but I got out of it. And like, like I say, like, had I not grown up without a mom and the situation I grew up in, had I not had this just terrible relationship, I wouldn't have the honor and privilege of talking to people like you. I wouldn't have been able to do 1.5 million pushups and help the families and, and, and probably wouldn't be the person that I am today. So I try to take that, all that shit that we have in life yeah. and use, I mean, it, it's there, right? I mean, like, it is what it is. I can't change any of my past or any of my, any of the things that happened. So I might as well use it in a positive way. So that's really kind of what I tried to do is just take all that shit and use it to fuel the fire to more move towards a more impactful life. Turning a negative into a positive is very yeah. tough. People can't very do that a lot. So that is, uh, hard. You I mean, that. It, it, it's hard. I mean, so, but doing 1.5 million pushups, you burn off a lot of anger too. So that's good to go. Yeah. Yeah. You probably have no problem opening up pickle jars at your house. You probably just like, <laughs> yeah. boom, no problem. Break it up. You know? Yeah. Just crush it. Just put them all in there. Um, why is it weird for men to be in like those types of, uh, it's always like the, it feels like the men is, is at fault, but men can be verbally and physically abused in a domestic relationship. Like, why do you think that's, that's weird? I think because there, there's so many male messages about, you know, like, what does it mean to be a man? I mean, like, we got to be tough, you know, we're strong, you know, we don't show emotion, you know, and all that. I mean, the older, I mean, you're 35, you probably get it. I'm 46. I get it. I mean, that's all a bunch of BS. I mean, we, we aren't always tough and we are emotional, but those messages and kind of that, that mask that we wear, I think really kind of puts us in a position where maybe we don't always ask for help or we don't express ourselves. And for me, I had a lot of vulnerabilities and um, I didn't attend to any of those vulnerabilities to the degree that I should have. And it put me in a situation where, excuse me, I was really in a compromised kind of environment. And I, I, I say to people like, you know, I might be able to average 4,000 pushups a day, but if I don't take care of my vulnerabilities, I promise you I'm the weakest guy in the room. And I really mean that because it doesn't matter if I'm a dude or if I'm strong physically, if I don't take care of those vulnerabilities, I put myself in a position where somebody who's far weaker, you know, far smaller in stature can come in and hurt me and put me in a position where, you know, I'm, it's not good. So I think that uh, being a man, we can be in an abusive situation regardless of our size. I, I hear you. And I think we're both mentally tough, especially you. So I, I, uh, I like that. I like that a lot. That's a good answer. Um, all right, let's end with this. I always like to know three things that that people are grateful for right now. Um, they can be large, small, today, yesterday. What are you grateful for? So I, I'm for me, it's it's pretty simple. I'm grateful for my my children. I'm grateful for life. I'm so happy to be alive, and I'm grateful for the people that serve our community and country. I mean, they make such an impact on us on all of our lives, and that's kind of the the blanket that uh, protection that's there that allows us to do push-ups or do podcasts or whatever it is that we uh, we choose to uh, you know chase after. So I'm just so thankful for my family and my time and uh, the people that serve our country and communities. Perfect answer. Now, I always like asking this because I'm a big wrestling fan, as you pointed out, my my wrestling belt. Do you remember Brutus the Barber Beefcake? This is how well I know Brutus the Barber Beefcake, all right? That was so, my favorite wrestler growing up. Fun fact. So in <laughs> Boston, we have the transit system of the MBTA. I think it's yeah. Massachusetts uh, 
I don't know. Fuck, I don't even know my own trans system. But he used to work there. Like he used to but work. You know Brutus though. That's good. Oh yeah, I'm a wrestling historian. I go like I'm like I'm good with the, like the early '80s, even though I'm 35. But I just went back. But he worked at the MBTA. Funny story. And after or before? Oh, way after. Like after he retired. So this was oh, like shit. Yeah, this is probably like mid 2000s. But the funniest thing was he had a coke problem, and it was during the anthrax scare. So they thought it was <laughs> anthrax because he left his bag of coke behind. That's one of my favorite <laughs> stories of. Brutus the Baba Beefcake. I'm I, hopefully he's well now, but that is the most know. like smallest like story about him that I I found. I was like that is a remarkable. I don't even know why I liked him so much, but it was just Brutus the Barber Beefcake. Oh, one of the most ridiculous uh, gimmicks of all time. Came back, came down with the shears. It's like, who, like what? Like, are you cutting people's hair with that? Yeah, Brutus I think the he Barber. had a mullet too, didn't he? Oh, he had a great mullet. Oh, yeah, he was, was nice. uh, that's one of the funniest picks for a wrestler of all time, though. I love it. Uh, anthrax scare. Now, if you were uh, like, so yeah, think about this. You're coming out to an arena. You're going down the 50-yard line and doing push-ups. The crowd's going wild. What theme song is going to be playing for you coming out? Oh, man. Well, I'm picturing myself like Hacksaw Jim Duggan. <laughs> I love it. And uh, I got the two by four. So it, it's probably got to be that that Rocky song. I, I just love that Rocky song. So, but yeah, a little Hacksaw Jim Duggan and the two by four in that song. That'd be, yeah. that'd be what it looks like, I think. Yeah, just the she is on the side, just in case you had to cut, you had to cut the grass. <laughs> just in case somebody needs to cut that hair. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. What's your favorite Rocky movie? Which one? Probably Rocky. The original Rocky movie is probably my favorite one. Oh, see, I like four because he ended the Cold War. Yeah, see, that was good. They're all great. I mean, yeah, like yeah. you can't you can't beat a good Rocky movie. I, I miss that. I didn't. I think I saw Creed, and I think there's Creed two. Yeah, I didn't see the second one, but yeah, I've I've always been a fan of Rocky. I mean, he's like the the American dream underdog, and he's just a a tough dude who grits out whatever it is. And yeah, it's just a great story. It really is. Now we'll finish with this big Wisconsin guy. So obviously, you're a cheesehead, Green Bay Packers. Yep, yeah. I, th- I think you broke the news to me when uh, Aaron Rodgers came out with some uh, mental health news about him, right? Uh, I don't know that I did. What what mental? What oh, I thought I thought he 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 opened up about mental health not too long ago. I I thought I read that somewhere. I thought you told but me he that. did. He was, yeah. He was, I mean he's you know he's a multi millionaire press guy. So I mean he's, he had. A, I think he felt like the organization was kind of not honoring his perspective on things and not listening to him and you know but it's it's kind of a strange phenomenon i mean everybody worships the packers here in in green bay but really i think aaron's kind of alienated a few people here and so people are kind of like you know i think we're we're midwestern we're middle class and he's kind of a california boy who's yeah. making a lot of cash and so i don't think people are as sympathetic to his whining as maybe it would be uh, on the coast somewhere right but, right yeah i mean i know it's tough to be Aaron, but are you excited they resigned him i mean i'm happy for i think it's good for it's good for green bay it's good for our community i mean i, I think he probably pre- gives us the best chance to win which is good for you know our, our you know economics situation here in wisconsin so we'll see what happens i mean brett Favre, yeah. brett Favre, aaron Rodgers. Oh, Brett Favre all day long. Now that guy's tough. I mean, like, he, he's one of those guys, he's a, you know, he's from, you know, Alabama or wherever he's from, but yeah, he's a, he's a tough guy, but he, I just saw a video of him on Facebook the other day. It was a memory for, um, that he came up a couple of years ago and he insisted that the guy who worked in the mail room at Lambeau field come to this awards banquet. And cause it, and then he had struck up a friendship with him, but it was just like, you know, the guy in the mail room, that's who Brett wanted to talk with and hang with. You know, he didn't want to hang out with all these big wigs. He wanted to hang out with the dude in the mail room. So it just kind of represents Brett. He's kind of a down to earth guy. I think. Right. Yeah. They always call him the gunslinger. Right? The perfect, yeah, he's, perfect yeah, he's, name he's, from. And I feel, I feel like that shows a lot of character about who you become friends with at a job site, because I feel like I judge people of how they treat the custodians at any business. And, absolutely. And cause like, I'm always like talking to them after, like there might be a language barrier, but I'll sit there and chat with them. But anyone that treats someone lesser than them for no reason. I'm like, yeah, this person is no good. So that's a telltale sign. So that, Brett Favre. It, it, was, it was such a cool story. I mean, he said this male guy, I mean, he was excited to see him, but you know, and again, I don't know all the backstory, but apparently they got to know each other during his time here. And, and he was always good. He was, all, Brett was always good to like the parking lot attendants and the people that worked the stands, like you said. I mean, I think he was kind of just an everyday kind of average guy who had a phenomenal arm and a yeah. hard head. Yeah, fantastic. Nate Carroll, the push-up man, 
1.5 billion plus. I thank you so much. Everyone listen to this right now. Go check out the Tunnel to Towers Foundation. Go do your push-ups. Go beat Nate Carroll's record if you can, but you got to donate to the Tunnel of Towers Foundation. Nate, thank you so much, man. This was a pleasure to chat with you, and I'm so glad to chat with the, the, the push-up man himself. Thank you, Tim. It was nice meeting you and nice talking with you. Thank you, man. You have a good one. You as well, my friend. This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. If you are feeling suicidal, please dial 911.